Hi there, my name is Meredith and I am the Environmental Center Director for the Habitat Grace Maritime Museum. Today I'm going to be giving a lecture about mussels and their relationship with the Conowingo Dam. So a little bit about my background and why I'm really excited to give a lecture about mussels. Um, before I moved here, I worked as a naturalist for a nature center in Minnesota. When I worked at a nature center in Minnesota, I was fortunate enough to be able to run a research project about freshwater mussels. So freshwater mussels were once really abundant in the small town that I lived in and over time were few and far between. We noticed that the issues that mussels faced there is similar to the issues that mussels face all over the country and all over the world. Um, so the research project that I conducted was in response to a study by the DNR that supported um, the idea that though mussels were few and far between in the streams and tributaries that mussels could be reintroduced and that would be successful. So long story short, the research project allowed us to keep mussels in different parts of the streams on the Nature Center property and monitor their growth and their health to see if they would actually be able to survive in the waterway. And we found that they would be able to. So What was interesting about that was there were some sites where we thought that mussels would not be able to survive based on water quality standards, but they actually were able to. So I had a lot of fun doing that research project. I learned a lot. And as I mentioned before, I'm excited to share what I've learned with you all. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about Mussels, dams, and why there's a relationship between those two things and why that's something we should care about. We're also going to discuss what mussels actually are. A lot of us have sort of a general concept, but there's a lot more to them than people give them credit for. We're also going to discuss their importance. So why is this something to learn about at all? Um, and how the Conowingo Dam in particular has affected mussels and other creatures in the bay. So, mussels. How do we define them? Mussels are defined by a few different categories. Mussels are a type of shellfish, so a fish that lives in a shell, and they're in the mollusk family. So, to put that in perspective, some other creatures that are also in the mollusk family are snails, squids, and octopus. So they're all fairly closely related. Mollusks are classified by three main things. Those things are their soft bodies, their head, and their foot. Now, their head and their foot are not like our head and our feet, right? Um, but that's just the way that they're defined. We'll get into what the foot is and why that's important a little bit later. Some mussels live in fresh water, some live in salt water, some live in brackish water, which is a combination of the two. And mussels are also defined as bivalves. So we mentioned that they're a type of shellfish. The definition of bivalve is basically that bi means two. Um, so Mussels are two shells connected at a hinge and the soft body lives inside of that. Interestingly, there are 15,000 different types of mussels in the world, which isn't something that I knew until I started researching for this presentation, so. Okay, as I mentioned before, a lot of people think that mussels are fairly basic creatures, but there's a lot more to them than most people are aware of. And we're not gonna get into every piece of their body, but we're gonna talk about some of the important parts. So how mussels make sense of the world around them. 
They have tactile receptors, which means that they're able to feel things. They have visual receptors, which means that they're able to see things. And they have chemosensory, which means that they're able to smell. So when I say that muscles are able to see things, it's not in the way that you and I are able to see things. It's mostly just being able to pick up changes in shadows, which allows them to um, protect themselves from predation. It helps with reproduction, um, that, kind of, that kind of thing. One of the most important characteristics of muscles is the way that they feed. So muscles are filter feeders, which means that they take water in through their incurrent siphon, which you can see on the bottom right. They take out the important nutrients on the inside that they can actually digest and process and use for energy, and then release the rest of the water out through their excurrent siphon. Now, the reason why this is so important is because just by eating, they wind up cleaning the waterways. So they are one of our best water cleaners, I guess, um, that we have. One of the, the best resources that we can use to clean up waterways. Um, we're going to get a lot more into that later because it's a really important process. But just to set the stage for that. So the difference between freshwater and saltwater mussels. There are a lot of differences anatomically between the two, but um, according to one website when I was researching for this project, the difference between freshwater and saltwater mussels is, quote, marine mussels taste wonderful in a garlic butter or marinara sauce, while freshwater mussels taste like an old dirty shoe, end quote. Now, there's a lot more that's different between the two than just taste. I just thought that that was kind of silly. So anatomically, both freshwater and saltwater mussels have, as we mentioned before, a soft body, a head, and a foot. Now the foot on freshwater mussels and saltwater mussels is very different. So the foot is an organ that is different depending on what type of muscle we're working with, but generally speaking, it works to keep a muscle in the area that it wants to be. So it sort of acts like a suction cup or an anchor. You can think of it either of those two ways. A freshwater muscle's foot is large, powerful, and is used, um, as I mentioned before, like sort of an anchor to keep it in place. Um, Otherwise, it would easily get washed away with the tide or activities or storms. So the foot works to keep a muscle in place. It also works to allow the muscle to move through the substrate. Though a saltwater muscle's foot is a little bit different. So it's not nearly as large. It's not nearly as powerful. Um, and on the inside of a saltwater muscle's foot there's a pit that creates something called abyssal thread, which if you've ever seen blue mussels in the wild, they're usually connected to each other and a whole bunch of other little things. And if you look closely, the way that they're able to connect themselves to each other and other things in the environment is through these really, really thin, almost invisible strings. Those strings are super powerful and are created in that pit in the foot. So they're able to anchor themselves by actually creating an anchor for themselves, which is really neat. This helps them to not be washed away with the tide. Ocean currents are a lot stronger than freshwater currents, generally speaking. So that's where the Bissell threads come in. And interestingly, marine mussels or saltwater mussels are actually not as closely related to freshwater mussels as you might think. Saltwater mussels are more closely related to oysters, scallops, and um, other things of the like than they are to freshwater mussels. So they're not as closely related as one might think. One of the biggest differences between the two types of mussels, freshwater and saltwater mussels, is the way that they reproduce. 
So we're gonna watch a video about freshwater mussel reproduction. I'm not sure how the audio is gonna come through because this is a recording, um, but I will link the video. It's a YouTube video um, in the, the comments. So the important part is the visual anyways. In the streams of Missouri lives the Lampsilis mussel, a simple animal with an extraordinary life cycle. To reach adulthood, its young must spend part of their lives inside a fish, the largemouth bass. To get there, the mussels must make physical contact, a difficult task as mussels don't swim. But the bass has a weakness. It's a voracious predator of small fish, particularly darters. Even the slightest wriggle of a darter's tail will attract bass. Believe it or not, the fish on the mussel is an imitation, a perfect replica that will lure bass within striking range. The mussel can somehow sense approaching fish and wriggles its lure faster to entice them. If it gets the twitching just right, the remarkable likeness should do the rest. On impact, the mussel squirts its young into the bass's mouth. These snap shut on the gills like spring-loaded traps. Here they stay, drawing blood from the fish until several weeks later they drop off as tiny, fully formed mussels. Also a favorite prey of the bass are these striped shiners, and some mussels mimic them. Considering mussels are blind and have never seen a shiner, the likeness is incredible. The eyes, fins, and even the stripe look just right, yet the mussel knows nothing of its own appearance. These lures have evolved because bass more often attack mussels that look like fish so fishy-looking mussels leave more descendants. After millions of years of blind evolution, this process of selection has turned mussel flesh into a lifelike lure. It takes a good imitation to fool a bass in clear water, and some of them are incredible. This darter mimic even has a mouth which gulps. This mussel is the same species, but its curious leopard print design may not find a taker, and its genes will go no further. This lure looks pretty good, but the bass is unconvinced and turns it down. Mussel lures are constantly improving, but fish are getting ever better at recognizing fakes. It's another arms race and it's still creating diversity in the streams of Missouri to this day. So as we know from watching that video, the reproduction of a freshwater mussel is fascinating. I wanted to take a moment to look at their life cycle just in a little bit more depth before we move on to why mussels are so important. So as you can see on the top left, there's an image of the larval stage of a mussel's life. I wanted to include this just because they look so wild to me, sort of like worms that have been drawn on with a marker. So as we know from the video, the larvae need to survive inside the gills of a host fish in order to reach their juvenile stage. Now this can last for a couple of weeks or several months. Now I'm sure you're wondering, how can all of these baby mussels 
survive in a host fish's gills without the host fish noticing or being harmed or maybe even dying. Well, this is a parasitic process, which means that the larva feed off of the host, but can't actually kill the host because otherwise they wouldn't be able to reach the life stage that they need to. So parasitic processes sometimes can harm the host, but almost always don't harm to a degree where their host is overcome by it because otherwise they wouldn't be able to get what they need out of the host. So the larva live in the host fish's gills for, as I mentioned before, a matter of weeks or a matter of months. Um, and then it can take juveniles two to nine years before they reach sexual maturity. What's really fascinating about freshwater mussels is they live for a really long time. Um, adults can typically live between 60 and 100 years. So that also gets into their importance a little bit later, how long they're able to live for. So why are mussels so important? There are several reasons why. The first that I'm going to discuss is the fact that mussels are an indicator species, which means that we can monitor their health to have an understanding of water quality conditions. So the healthier the mussel, the healthier the water, um, it's pretty interrelated. So we can use the health and population numbers, as I mentioned before, to determine the health of a water body. This is largely because mussels require clean, well oxygenated water with low levels of physical or chemical impurities. So they can't handle a lot of pollution. They can't handle a lot of um, heavy metals, chemicals, things of the like. So as an indicator species, they've been used not just to monitor waterways, but actually to determine whether or not fresh water is safe for human consumption. So there are a few different places or a few different freshwater facilities that actually use mussels to see if the water is good enough for people. One of these places is in Poland where eight individual mussels are used to, as I mentioned before, determine if water is safe. So the way that this works, you can see an image on this slide. What you're looking at is a mussel with a spring super glued to the top of the shell. And that on the end is sort of like a little button that's used to hit a sensor directly below. So that black tube is a sensor. The way that this works, when mussels are happy and healthy and doing just fine, their shell is open. They're filter feeding, they're taking water in, they're pushing water back out, and their shell needs to be open to do so. When they are stressed, and the water isn't healthy enough for them and they're not feeling very well, then they seal their shell in order to keep water from coming inside. Now, when they seal their shell, that spring touches the sensor, which sets off an alarm. So as I mentioned before, there are eight muscles determining the health of the water that's going into these people's homes. Um, so if just one muscle closes its shell, then it's not like all of the alarms are going off because sometimes muscles, like every other living thing, need to rest. But if four of the eight muscles close their shell, then alarms go off, freshwater technicians are alerted, and all of the water that is being pumped into people's homes through the tap is turned off automatically until the freshwater technicians can figure out what the problem is. So I just find that absolutely fascinating. And they're not the only place to be doing this. Um, the main reason why this small city in Poland is using freshwater mussels to make sure that their water is healthy is because in this part of Poland, they have a pretty old pipe system and there are certain heavy metals that have been known to leak into the waterways, like 
chromium through the pipes. So muscles cannot handle the heavy metals like chromium. So this is a prevention method in order to make sure that people are drinking something that's potable, which I think is pretty fascinating. So mussels are important not just because they're an indicator species, they're also important because they filter feed, and as we know already, filter feeding cleans the water. So each freshwater mussel is able to filter up to 15 gallons of water a day. That's a lot of water per mussel. So if you have a very large population of mussels in a water body, the water is getting constantly cleaned and cycled through. And when I say cleaned, I mean they're able to remove nitrogen and phosphorus from the water column, which is one of the main causes of algal blooms, which some of us may know that algal blooms are when the tops of water gets covered in this green stuff that is actually toxic for people and pets. Um, they're fueled by too much nutrients in the water. And when algal blooms are at their peak, they can actually rid the water column of oxygen, which leads to fish kills. So algae in large quantities, when it's not a good type of algae, can be really dangerous. But freshwater mussels take in the main things that lead to them being able to survive and thrive so well. So they help prevent algal blooms. And not only do they remove nitrogen and phosphorus from the water column, they actually lock up those nutrients in their system so it doesn't get released again. They do the same with carbon. They do the same with microplastics. They do the same with pesticides. And they can actually take E. coli out of the water and transform it into something that isn't harmful anymore. So they're taking out pollution, they're taking out plastic, they're taking out E. coli, and in doing so, they're then cleaning the water for everything else that lives in the ecosystem. So mussels are so important to ecosystem health and even our health. When you think about the fact that we, excuse me, I hit a few slides. When you think about the fact that we live on the bay, our drinking water comes from the bay. If it's getting cleaned before it goes into the freshwater system that is then cleaned by technicians, then we just know that our water is healthier for us to consume, for us to recreate in, and um, for all of the other things that we use water for. So these are all of the freshwater mussels that can be found in Maryland. There are 18 different types of mussels that can be found here. Of the 18, five are endangered, two are invasive, and seven are threatened or of special concern. So if you break that down, only four of the 18 mussels found in Maryland are both native and stable. Those numbers are not very good. And those numbers are pretty consistent with freshwater mussel populations all over the country and all over the world. Now, threats to freshwater fish are also threats to freshwater mussels because mussels need to survive in a host fish in order to reach their juvenile stage. So some of the main fish that freshwater mussels in this area use as their host fish are shown here. Now, all of the mussels shown use these fish. So at least four or more types of mussels use each of these individual fish. And for some really key players here, like largemouth bass, half of the native mussels in Maryland use them as a host fish. So these fish are really important to the health of mussels. Now, some of the fish that you can see here are, there's pumpkin seed, there's bluegill, there's American eel, there's large and smallmouth bass, there's um, a darter, all sorts of different kinds. But these are the most important players in mussel reproduction in this area. Now, I mentioned before that only, 
Let me see here. Only four of the 18 freshwater mussels that live in Maryland are both native and stable. Mussels are actually the most threatened class of organisms in the United States. So more than half of all mussel species face extinction because of all sorts of different things like pollution, climate change, a loss of habitat and viruses. And it's estimated that we've lost 90% of the mussels in the bay. 90%, that's a massive number. So only 10% of mussels that have existed in the bay historically are still present. That's unbelievable. And one of the main causes of this is damming, and in our area, the Conowingo Dam. So in North America alone, 30 freshwater mussel species have gone extinct over the past century, and 65% of those surviving are considered endangered, threatened, or vulnerable. And scientists believe that the main threat to mussels is the large-scale damming of rivers. So historically, there was a blitz of dam construction in the 1920s and 1930s, which destroyed thousands of miles of habitat and fragmented even more. This is a problem because mussels cannot survive in deep, poor, oxygenated conditions, which is something that dams create. And fish can't swim through a dam. So if their host fish is not able to have the full range that it would normally have, then mussels are not able to have the full range that they would normally have. So dams blocking fish movements and fish migrations cut off mussel populations from being able to spread to the full range that they're supposed to. That's the biggest threat here. Now, as I mentioned, this problem is happening all over the country and all over the world. Um, I met with a woman who is local to Havre de Grace. Her name is Ruth Jessup. And she grew up in a small town in Iowa, and her family owned a button factory called Weber & Sons Button Company, Inc. And they actually made buttons out of the shells of freshwater mussels. You can see in the picture on the right where the buttons were popped out of using this big machine in order to pop them out. Um, her family started the company, Weber & Sons, in 1904, and... They maintained building this company for a long time. I believe they finally shut down in the 2000s. Um, but for a very long time, they made buttons out of mussel shells and eventually had to switch to making um, buttons out of plastic. Now, the reason why they had to switch making buttons out of plastic was because... In their area, a dam was installed, and all of a sudden, they didn't have enough muscles in order to create the buttons. So, they knew pretty quickly, without fully understanding the science behind what was going on, that dams were bad for muscles. That's something that everybody in the area knew, pretty quickly. Um, so, the dam built in Iowa led to a pretty drastic and almost immediate decline in muscle populations. So getting back to what's happening locally, our biggest threat here is the Conowingo Dam. So the Conowingo Hydroelectric Generating Station lies on the top of the Susquehanna River. So the river flows downstream from New York and Pennsylvania to Maryland, where the Conowingo Dam is located. The reservoir behind the dam contains lots and lots of sediment. The sediment is full of heavy metals, nitrogen, phosphorus, silt, and sand. And the reservoir was built to prevent all of this from going into the bay, which is objectively a good thing. But as of 2015, I believe, 
this reservoir has been completely full. So it's no longer able to do its job. It's no longer able to prevent sediment and pollutants from entering the bay. And what's actually happening is when we have big storm events or flash flooding, things of the like, all of that stuff that's been built up behind the reservoir for years and years is being pushed into the waterway. So the reason why sediment is such a problem, we talked about all of the pollutants that go with it, which we know why those pollutants are bad for the bay. Um, the reason why sediment is such a problem is because it reduces the water clarity, which makes it hard for light to penetrate the water. So plants living in the bay that are important to ecosystems don't get enough sunlight to photosynthesize. Um, a decrease in water clarity makes it hard for fish to find their prey and for fish to eat. And it can even clog up the gills of a fish so it makes it hard for them to breathe. So sediment in large quantities being suspended in the water column is really bad for the entire ecosystem. So we know the threats to freshwater mussels. What can we all do about these threats? Firstly, we can learn more about freshwater mussels in your area. You can determine what types of species you have, what quantity of species you have, what diversity you have, um, and you can work with other volunteers and local watershed stewards in order to come up with a sort of plan to protect them. Knowing what species you have to begin with gives you the knowledge and the power to then protect them. Second, you can advocate for mussels in your area um, if you know that there are certain projects or construction sites that will affect the waterway, then you can talk to the folks working on the project. You can talk to local legislators. You can try to figure out how to make sure that the project takes muscles in mind. Um, lastly, you can do your part to reduce threats. So minimizing pesticide use on lawns and gardens. Um, doing your part not to introduce invasive species to waterways, like checking the bottom of your boat before you move it from one place to another. Um, general good, good practice with preventing pollution from waterways and preventing the spread of invasive species. So these are the main sorts of things that you can do to help against the threat of freshwater mussels. Um, Knowledge is power, and it's important to understand what's going on in your area. So that is the end of my lecture. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comment section below, and we will let you know what we figure out. Thanks for your time.